Welcome everyone. We're so excited to have you all join us today um, for a session on coaching teachers remotely and providing them with emotional and instructional support. Um, we know that they need it now more than ever. We have a couple of housekeeping items that we'd love to talk before we begin with the content and introducing you to our panelists. So first, all participants have been muted here. Um, please turn up your speakers as loud as you like. We're not going to play any more music, so we won't hurt your ears. Um, but we want you to hear our panelists in a few moments. Second, we are recording this webinar live. Um, so we're going to send out the recording afterwards so you can share it or watch it again. Um, we'll also share a copy of these slides as well as any resources we mention on the line or that the participants and panelists want to share. Of course, feel free to chat us at any time. Um, if you have concerns or technical difficulties, you can chat to our tech support colleague who's on the line right now, or you could also chat all panelists. If you could provide your email address, that way she can respond to you via email um, or get in touch with you one-on-one -on -one if you're having any technological difficulties. All right, so let's dig in. Um, hello, my name is Kendall King. I'm the Consulting Manager at Public Impact. I honestly feel honored today to have the opportunity to introduce you to three amazing multi-classroom leaders, all of whom led teams of teachers throughout the COVID shutdown last year. And then they have several lessons learned from that experience that they're taking into their practice this year as they support team teachers remotely or in hybrid roles. Here are our objectives for this session. We hope that you're able to learn from these multi-classroom leaders and um, understand how they continue to provide strong support, both emotionally and instructionally for their team teachers, again, in a remote or a hybrid setting, and then amid the crises that we're dealing with now as a nation and a world. We also hope you'll have an opportunity to ask questions of your own desire to these multi-classroom leaders. Um, so whatever your burning questions are, send them our way. We're excited um, for them to hear your voice. And then lastly, we hope that you're able to leave with some tips, some tricks, or some best practices that you can put into your own circle or um, into your own practice as a teacher leader, as a teacher, a school leader, or supporting other educators in some way. So many of you are already familiar with our work at Public Impact. Um, but for those of you who are not, Public Impact is a national education consulting firm. We're based in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Our mission is to dramatically improve learning outcomes for all students with a focus on students of color, um, students from low income families, and other students whose needs have historically not been met. One of the main ways we strive to meet this mission is through our creation of the Opportunity Culture Initiative. Um, Opportunity Culture aims to reach more students with excellent instruction and frankly to disrupt the status quo of education as we know it. Um, we hope to pave the way for excellent teachers to earn significantly more money by reaching more students and by increasing their leadership scope. The word you hear educators say the most often with Opportunity Culture is support. Um, it's all about support, supporting new teachers, supporting veteran teachers, and supporting all teachers in between that spectrum. Um, they do it through on-the-job guidance every day through lots of activities. And as one teacher put it, um, we help them become the teacher they've always aspired to be, and now they actually have the support to do it. And research is showing the efficacy of opportunity culture. Teachers who were on average at the 50th percentile in terms of student learning gains, who then joined teams led by proven excellent teachers, are now getting student growth results that are matching or approaching that of excellent teachers. We're really excited about these results and what they could mean for students. And we're really excited to see how the initiative is growing across the nation. You can see on this map here where we're locating and how we've grown since the 2013-14 school year. We're now being implemented in um, or in the planning stages in more than 360 schools across 37 sites and in 10 states across the nation. And we're growing every year, which is really exciting. Our panelists are gonna represent three of these districts um, from a large city district to a smaller rural district in North Carolina. Um, so we're gonna give you lots of different experiences that you'll hear today. So that's a little bit about us. Um, that's a lot. I'd love to pause and get a sense of who exactly is on the line today. So if you feel so inclined, if you could find your chat button at the bottom of your screen, we'd love to see what's your role in education. And if you feel compelled to share with us, perhaps your name or really your location, where are our folks coming from today? So I'll pause for a moment and let you all chat in a little bit about so we can see who we have on the line.
Awesome. I see some Texas. I see North Carolina, Memphis. Very cool. I'm seeing MCLs. I'm seeing other folks. I'm seeing instructional coaches. Very cool. Dean of Students, Assistant Principals, Kentucky. Very cool. I'm seeing a lot of resources and or different people, different roles, different states. Um, very exciting to see. Keep those coming. It's fun. And I think it's helpful for our panelists to get a pulse of who we see on the line and who's joining us today. Um, it's definitely exciting. All right. So we've mentioned this word multi-classroom leader quite a bit, right? Um, and so who exactly are they? Some of you are multi-classroom leaders on the line. We certainly have three joining us as panelists today. Um, but what do they do if you're not as familiar? So multi-classroom leaders, or MCLs for short, form the cornerstone of an opportunity culture. MCLs are teachers with a record of high growth student learning and leadership competencies. So they continue to teach for part of the time um, while also leading small collaborative teams of two to eight teachers. They could include paraprofessionals on their team and also teacher residents. Now, MCLs have built in school time day to observe and coach their team teachers frequently, um, generally at least weekly, sometimes even daily in many cases. Um, they provide very intensive hands-on supports like co-teaching, um, co-planning, modeling lessons, um, leading data analysis, and leading team meetings. They also take accountability for the learning results of all students on the team, and that feels a little bit different than other traditional roles. They're not only providing guidance and support, but they also have skin in the game. Um, they're truly held accountable for student results, unlike potentially a traditional coach or a traditional facilitator role in many of our districts. That sense of really being in it all together collaboratively is something that team teachers have appreciated time and time again. Across the nation, MCLs are earning an average of 20% more than the average teacher salary in their district, um, which is big. And the paid, all of these are paid within regular school budgets, um, which again, is, could be different than other initiatives which could be formed out of and funded out of grant funding. Already there are hundreds of MCLs across the US and our goal is to grow this to thousands and even more um, so that more teachers and more students can receive that benefit um, across the nation. So you may be thinking, well, this is great. Um, this is all great in a normal year. I can see how co-teaching and modeling and all of these resources would be really helpful. Um, but this year is not normal. And you're exactly right. Um, it's not normal. This year, our nation is facing crises, right? Um, we are not coming in to in our school in the same headspace that we normally would. And teacher leadership just frankly must look different. Um, honestly, the killings of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd and others have really spotlighted the racial injustice in our society that have been around our country since its inception. And so this racial violence, the ongoing racism and the fight to end it is continuing to affect school communities and beyond. In addition to that, nearly 200,000 people at this point have died within our country and many more have been badly sickened due to the pandemic. Teachers are working with the weight of this on their shoulders, um, as well as the financial impacts of the shutdowns at the on their families, their students, and the communities. Acknowledging all this is really intense. It's a lot to take in, and I'm going to pause for a second for a moment of silence for victims of COVID-19 and their families, for victims of racial violence, and for any others who are suffering right now. I know that's not enough time for everything that's happening. And I think it's important though to acknowledge before we move on the reality of our crises that we're facing and to norm both what we're actually talking about in terms of crises. So yes, 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 this year is very different. Uh, we thought one thing that might be helpful to frame our discussion today would be a familiar framework. Um, and so this framework here, it could be useful for understanding the emotional needs. It might be familiar to many of you, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. 
So as you know, it explains that we all require basic needs um, like shelter and food and a sense of security or safety. Then we require psychological needs like friendships and a sense of connection and self-esteem until ultimately we can get to that self-actualization, which is the desire to grow and become the best that one can be. Of course, MCL, as I'm sure we'll hear today, they're always considering these needs in any year, but this year more than ever, it's absolutely crucial that MCL can create a sense of safety, belonging, and respect for the teachers on their team, because the reality is, is that teachers might be showing up with gaps lower on that pyramid. In addition to all of this, it's crucial that we think about we also have a learning crisis where gaps among students are getting bigger and bigger as we speak due to the crises. The main goal of opportunity culture is high growth student learning, even when students face significant challenges, and that just doesn't change during a pandemic. On the screen, you'll see our framework for our instructional excellence, which is based on hard research and what great opportunity educators tell us is critical. As you can see on the screen, excellent instructors are planning ahead. They're connecting with students and families. They're leading the classroom with purpose and compassion. They execute rigorous and personalized lessons. And ultimately, they're constantly monitoring, adjusting, and sharing data to continually improve their instruction. You'll see in the chat that my colleague Sharon, who is a participant on the line, is going to send out a link to the summary on our website for more details. She'll also be sharing out links as we go along, and she'll share them after this webinar as well in the follow-up email. So when MCLs can support their teachers emotionally and instructionally, then teachers can support their students' emotional and instructional needs, which can ultimately lead to students feeling better and learning more. This is our goal. So how are our MCLs on the ground actually doing this? How are they leading their teams remotely during crises and periods of high stress to still ensure that all students are receiving an excellent instruction? I'm excited to introduce you all to our MCL so that we can find out and hear what they're doing on the ground. Um, so without further ado, we have our three MCLs um, and I'd love to have them each come off mute and introduce themselves. Um, Sherelle, perhaps we'll start with you and then we can go in order of the screen. Um, if each of you could introduce your name um, and share the grades and subjects that you leave as, lead, as well as your school and district, that would be awesome. Hi, I'm Sheryl Sanders. I am the uh, lead for the 6-8 Math and Science team at Martin Millennium Academy in Edgecombe County, North Carolina. I'm Keisha Wheat, and I am the Literacy MCL at Randolph Elementary School and I support teachers in kindergarten through second grade. I'm Fred Hoffman in uh, Guilford County Schools, North Carolina at Fairview Elementary, uh, working with fourth and fifth grade science teachers, but also supporting other grade levels as well in regards to our male students. Lovely, thank you all for introducing yourselves and for being here today, we're excited to learn from you. I have several questions prepared that I'd love to ask you all. Um, and then after that, I'm gonna to shift to the participants on the line to ask some of their burning questions and see what you all would like to know. As I ask those questions, I'd like for the folks on the line, you can go ahead and start thinking about what questions you might wanna ask. So at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little icon that says q and A. It looks like this, I just circled it on the computer. Um, and that's where you can actually click that button and you can type in any questions that you'd like to ask our panelists. Then if you see a question that you'd like to also get answered, you can like it by clicking that little thumbs up button at the bottom and that will essentially upvote it. So the questions with the more likes will show up higher on the screen and we'll know to prioritize those questions when we get to our Q&A portion. So feel free to start typing that in um, as we start with our first um, prepared questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen so that you can see all the participants on the line. All right, so my first question for you all, and why don't we still go in that order that was on the screen? So Sherelle first, and then we can follow up, go as follows. So given the crises we discussed moments ago and the uncertainty of what the rest of the school year will look like, I'm wondering how are you all addressing the socio-emotional needs of your teachers? Um, I appreciate you, Kendall, for like enlightening us. Um, 
with the information and making sure that everyone is aware uh, of what's happening and how important it is. Um, one way um, that we're addressing um, social emotional learning is just being able to um, check in with our teachers every day. Um, so I like to ask, how are you whenever we have a conversation um, and just reminding them to take time for themselves. Um, and just understand that everything is okay. Nothing needs to be rushed. Um, we also need to, like I said, just take our time. Um, to piggyback kind of off of what Sherelle said, uh, I think the how are you question is one of the most important questions. I think that as a coach, you have to make sure that when you say how are you, they understand that you're not asking about the teacher. You're not asking about Miss Sanders or Mr. Hoffman or Miss King. You're asking about Sherelle or Fred or Keisha so that they understand that you care about who they are as a person. Um, because we're going through a lot as teachers, but who we are at home comes through a lot. And so making sure that they understand that how are you question refers really to who they are. Um, I think the other important thing that I've done with my teachers is to ensure them no matter what they say, teachers have a tendency that when they ask questions, they say, I'm so sorry, I just have one more question. And just to make sure that they understand that they aren't bothering you to say, you know, this is my job. I am here to support you. You are not alone in this work. And making sure that they know it's a team effort um, with everything that we're doing so that it's a us and it's never a I so teachers don't feel like they're alone in this space. Uh, Sherelle and Keisha did a phenomenal job already bringing great stuff to you. Uh, one of the things that I do is um, we have a, a vertical team meeting every week and in that vertical team meeting I'm able to ask the question of what's impacting you in your body, in your brain, and in your being. And that brings a lot of interesting responses, uh, as Kendall alluded to earlier, of just what we have going on and what we're facing as instructional coaches, uh, what our teachers are facing as well. And it's amazing some of the responses that I get there, because um, sometimes it's just literally physical stress. They feel like the weight of the world is on their shoulders. There's other times where it feels like they can't keep straight all the different small groups that they have to meet online or the one-on-ones that they have to have online or what was the next initiative by the district that's come down that may change their schedule radically. Uh, and so also just, you know, their passion for education uh, and how that can be a struggle some days. You know, I was just talking to, to my administrator today and how one day is a great day and the next day can be that struggle of, I just miss physically seeing children and being in proximity and just feeling the energy of the educational moment. So asking that question at the start of meetings and throughout the week, really brings about an authentic response from them. Thank you all for sharing that. Um, it's really refreshing to hear how you're thinking of them as humans and kind of incorporating that not only as a one-off thing or like a separate thing, but also included within your ongoing work that you would be doing anyway. Um, I think that seems really valuable at any time, but especially now. My next question is kind of hitting on, we spoke earlier about the need to support teachers emotionally, but also instructionally. We can't give up on that instructional side. Um, otherwise, what are we doing, right? We, we have to be thinking about that learning crisis as well. Um, so as you're addressing the socio-emotional needs, in addition to that, how are you also supporting them to teach with excellence, but especially remotely? How are you doing that despite these challenges, remotely supporting them to teach towards excellence? Sherelle, why don't we start again with you and then go down the line? Sounds good, thank you. Um, one way um, that um, I'm working with teachers is we're continuing our coaching cycles. Um, just like before, we're having those one-on-one -on -one meetings about what I observe in the classroom. Now, it looks different now. Um, when we have our one-on-one -on -one conversations, I like to give the uh, my team teachers um, the opportunity to either be face-to-face -face because um, sometimes we like to be together, even though we're six feet apart, um, we're still in the same space or virtually. Again, it's about comfort level. Um, but we also have virtual classes, so we have live sessions. Um, so that looks different. I am in the space right now where I'm actually not uh, for release as an MCL. I'm filling in a vacant position. So I'm not always able to actually jump into a virtual classroom. So I have the privilege to watch a recording um, of a class and I still um, look for um, how students are engaged in the process. I'm still looking for um, 
the content that is there. Um, and now importantly, like it's not the same anymore. So there are other things. So I have, um, and I think Kendall has posted up some virtual classroom look for us. So I'm looking at not just how they're delivering the content in their classroom, but how are they posting their assignments on Google Classroom? Are they clear? Uh, are they engaging? Is it high quality material? I'm looking at how the instructions are posted. Can students access those um, assignments? I'm also looking to see like how teachers are planning. Um, I'm looking to see um, how they're providing feedback to scholars as well. Um, as for me, I, I still kind of stick to some of the things that we were taught in the beginning. Um, kind of taking on the mentality that even though we are in a virtual setting, um, we still need to rem remember what we're here for. And so um, working for CPS, we all use Google Classroom. And so all of my teachers have added me as a co-teacher. And so in the same way, if we were in a building, I can kind of go from room to room. I pop into virtual classrooms in that same manner. Um, and so with being in that space, I'm still able to provide that positive feedback. I think especially right now, um, everybody feels like they're new to learning. Everybody is a student right now because even though we went to school to teach, we did not go to school to teach virtually. And so we're all in this new space. And so teachers are very hard on themselves naturally. And so one of the things that I make sure I do is I always tell them something that they did good and says, you know what? this is better than maybe the last time that I was in there and making sure that I point out those positive things that they do. Um, what we have on the screen now is that, you know, we've been talk, talk, talked about doing enrollment conversations in the past. And so in the virtual setting, what I did was I created a Google form and this is just kind of part of the screenshot. And so it had their email, what do you consider your strength? Um, what's your area of growth? Um, it had what, uh, what goal, what's your goal for yourself this year? And I made sure that I included in that, don't think about this in a virtual setting. Think about a goal that you have for yourself and we can work to figure out how to achieve it in a virtual setting. And another really important question that I asked in that was, how can I support you? And I think that's like one of the most important questions is, if I'm your support, tell me what you feel like you need. Um, Again, because that goes into saying that you're not in this work by yourself in this space. And I still wanna make sure that teachers understand even in, in a virtual setting, high expectations for students still have to live. Student achievement at the end of the year, we still want to see it. And so we don't wanna lose sight of what the end goal is just because we're teaching in a virtual setting. We have to just kind of figure out how we can tailor it to the virtual setting. And so that's a lot of what I've done. Um, and being able to pop in, I'm also able to kind of model some things. So even in today, um, doing with one of the teachers, she popped, I, I do a prep. And so one of the teachers actually popped into my prep today because I was teaching the students how to use the Google Slides to do the drag and drop, right? And so the teacher actually joined in on my class to kind of see how I was doing it. And when the class was over and it was the asynchronous time, she stayed on and I was able to kind of talk her through some of those things. And so just remembering to, be that model and co-teach and help the teachers out, you know, even in this virtual setting, staying true to what opportunity culture represents. Yeah, staying true to, to what we're bringing to everybody. Uh, for me, uh, what I'll bring to you is looking at what a virtual team meeting looks like. So keeping everybody on the same track and same focal point. So here's just a generalized agenda, and there's a lot more detail that goes to this as well. But you can see in number one, that's that question that I brought up a, motion, a moment ago, and it's so critical to ask what's happening socially and emotionally for our teachers in a time where it's critical to understand that. Um, along with Maslow's hierarchy, if any of us have heard about the triune brain and better understanding how you know that fight or flight response uh, at the base of our brain and our brainstem makes a lot of sense why kids have the big emotional outburst and sometimes they're very nervous about coming to school uh, just because of a number of fears and factors. And then as you move into- the Fred, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. We're having a little trouble hearing you. It's a little bit quiet. Sure. 
Let me see if I can just turn off my headphones. I'll just do the internal microphone instead. Is that easier oh, to hear me? Better, better. Yeah, All right, awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank so you. going back to what I was stating and, and shifting from the understanding of, you know, the brainstem, the limbic system, getting through those big emotions for kids and then going into that cortex, you know, the same thing happens for adults and for teachers. If I can't get them past that fight or flight, am I really scared to go into my building because of COVID-19 and other considerations? But then also, am I thinking about, you know, just the emotions of teaching? Can I get upstairs to now get to the critical things such as, all right, let's make sure that of the Fairview five things, we believe in every student. What does that look like analytically? Let's go through the data that you've collected. Let's go through the attendance data that you've collected and let's go through the internet connectivity data and whether or not we can get to every student in our district. Um, what are our individual goals? Um, here in a moment, I'll show you the impact cycle and how Jim Knight utilizes um, what are called peer goals. Uh, and then you see content updates, you know, it's down in there that we're finally getting to the depth of content with teachers to understand what are some concerns, some frustrations and celebrations, and then action steps, you know, what's upcoming for us as well. I think on the next slide, Kendall's going to show you that particular thing of the impact cycle and Jim Knight. And, you know, these two that you see over here on the left, these are the goals for my teachers. And so in Jim Knight's book, he took, focuses on what are called peer goals. And he wants to make sure that those goals are powerful, that they're easy, that they're emotionally compelling, that they're reachable, and that they are student focused. And I found that middle one, uh, that middle E or the second E there of emotionally compelling is very critical for kids and also for instructors. So the two goals you see from my teachers are there on the left. You see that scholars to be fluent logging into all digital platforms. And so we can get data to drive small group and one-on-one -on -one instruction. Uh, we're doing a lot of asynchronous teaching through Canvas as our platform and not Google Classroom. And with that being said, we need to know um, what kids are fluent and which kids aren't so we can provide support one-on-one -on -one or in small groups as well. And then you see with my teacher B, you know, it's more about creating those moments during synchronous instruction of how do I get effective questioning happening so that I don't just get a yeah or a no or, or something of that nature when I'm hearing those things come back from students. And then the third thing I think that Kendall's gonna bring up for us is just a general kind of workflow um, that I've worked for with my teachers. You can definitely see some handwritten scribbles that are here so that way you can get a better understanding of sometimes the impromptuness of concept mapping and working with teachers. Um, but just what does our teaching look like on a weekly basis? What is our grading going to look like? What data collection are we going to have as far as social, emotional, and also academic? But then also, what's it going to look like office hours wise and synchronous teaching wise and with small groups? And on here, we basically created like this big checklist and it is ever evolving. I don't want you to think that, oh, this is the end all be all. This, this gets iterated on almost a weekly basis of, all right, what is our focus? What do we really have a passion for? So I go right back down to that, to that limbic system and say, you know, what are the big emotions you have when you're working with kids and working with teachers and just working in general in education? Let's make sure that we always remember to hit those. And there's one in particular that I'll draw your attention to, and that's under instruction there toward the middle in black. And one of my teachers brought to me a book called Cultivate Genius by Goldie Muhammad. And it is a phenomenal book that talks about the four concepts you see there of identity, skill development, intellect, and criticality. And that was an example of, this is my second year working with the teacher that pushed me toward that book. And I've been really excited that now that I'm getting year two with some of these teachers, I'm getting them to come with their passion and bring something to the table to say, hey, will you read this book with me? Or will you look at this blog post? Or will you listen to this podcast with me? And what do you think? Uh, and that's where things get really exciting instructionally. Thank you all for those insights. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing more and elaborating on some of those things based on these questions. We already have several questions coming in um, from the chat. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen so they can see all of our panelists. Um, so these questions are for anyone, um, whoever feels compelled, it could be all of you or one of you. Um, the first question that has the most votes right now is, um, if you could provide a little bit more about specifics, how are you observing the teacher and student interactions and providing feedback in a remote setting? So I know we heard Sherelle talk a little about recordings um, and then feedback meetings that could sometimes be in person if they prefer, prefer at a social distance um, or via um, virtual environment. Um, but I'm curious if you all could give some more specifics. What exactly does that look like and feel like when you're coaching teachers virtually? and observing them, for sure. Um, I'll go ahead. 
Um, so for me, we still do the, the traditional debriefs. It's in the same way that we're on Zoom right now. We kind of do it um, via video um, because that's just what we have. We don't, we can't be in person just, you know, because of the safety concerns, but the content is still the same. We still talk about what happened during the lesson. Um, and in terms of like the student engagement piece, because I am allowed as much as possible, if your teachers are using a platform that allows you to be a co-teacher, try to get that to happen. Um, because every assignment the students submit, I can still see that. When they're turned in through Google Classroom, I can access those assignments and I can kind of look through them too. So if we're talking about mastery of content or how well the students are doing, I'm able to look at that information. And so we still can have conversations around how well students are doing with the content. And so as much as possible, I wanna encourage you all, if you have a platform where you can be added as that co-teacher, um, please encourage your teachers to do that because I can see, uh, you know, all of the assignments that are created. So if we're talking about rigor or alignment to standards, I can check all of those things. Um, and then in the conversations, it's not just a random conversation. Those debrief conversations can always go back to how the assignment is related to the goal. You don't want to just have random conversations for the sake of having it. You want it to be true to the coaching cycle of there was a goal and we have these action items that are set to help us achieve the goal. So I think that's like one of the biggest things that I did. A lot of times um, when the students log off, I kind of stay on with the teachers. And so it's like real time. So sometimes I'm taking the notes as I'm on and then that debrief conversation is gonna happen right away because it's necessary, right? They want to know before they log on for that next class if there's something that could be done differently or something that should be addressed. And so making sure as, as much as you're available, provide your feedback in the same way the students should get theirs. We are the model for teachers in terms of how things should be. That was awesome, Keisha. I want to come teach at your school. <laughs> So uh, the, the way we've, we've taken a model where we do a lot more asynchronous teaching than we do synchronous. So we're doing a lot of recording, which just puts itself right into the platform of the get better faster protocol of see it, name it, do it. Cause literally I have teachers that will get two minutes, three minutes into a video and go, Oh no, 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 stop, stop. And this isn't like a Hollywood production where we can just have an editing crew to go back and edit things and stuff. So it's literally them starting back over from scratch a lot of times. Uh, and that lends itself to, like Keisha was just saying, that in the moment, like real time feedback of, hey, I just saw this and I just saw that happen. All right, let's think about what we want to do going forward. And you really are almost in real time now starting to go through that protocol of name it, see it, do it. And I found a ton of success with that really quickly um, to the point to where we're seeing the asynchronous lessons be really targeted and really on point. And then when we go into synchronous times of, you know, small groups, one-on-one, -on -one, that's when kids are asking really great questions because they're getting high quality instruction and we're able to get that feedback sometimes even before the lesson's going out. Cause I know in, in the first two years of me being an MCL, you know, a lot of our feedback would be, well, you just, taught it and we can't rewind time to support you to do that lesson again there's going to be some form of corrective instruction that's going to happen after the fact and so i've seen a lot of growth in my teachers of saying i don't like how that came out of my mouth so it's like literally we're practicing before we're doing it and it hasn't been something that we've had to really argue with teachers about it's been something that teachers have caught themselves we're there to provide additional support, suggestions as far as content, and it's driven some really great lessons. Uh, one of my teachers has a, her own little YouTube channel now where she's making kitchen science videos and kitchen science mini videos and stuff. And it's just awesome to see when you're able to give that support, like Keisha was saying, those teachers start to take off exponentially. Thank you. I think one thing that really resonates with me hearing you all talk is that kind of the, the nuts and bolts of the MCL role hasn't really changed. Um, you're just kind of shifting the platform and the way you're doing it from in-person to remote, um, which I think is really, really interesting. And sometimes at the beginning of the pandemic, not what people originally thought was the right thing. You know, like I think sometimes people shifted to uh, maybe I need to focus all in only on emotional support. And what we're seeing is most successful is doing both, um, continuing those MCL duties while also supporting emotionally. It looks like we have um, a, a, another question on here that's gotten a lot of likes. So I'm curious what you all will think um, and how you'll respond. So how have you coached teachers around time management during virtual learning? 
So I'm curious, like as a follow-up, is that going to be time management, like during a live session or time management as far as like planning um, for that? Why don't we start with planning, like overall planning of how to do everything, and then you could also hit on time management during a session if helpful. Um, I think a lot of it um, is we're coaching around like what are the big picture, what are the big key ideas um, that we need to focus on um, for instruction. Um, what I've noticed um, is that teachers want to continue to do the same exact thing they did in their classroom, which takes up a lot of time. And it's brought up a, a lot of questions of like how much time we actually spend in the classroom. So it tended to be teachers would fill in like a lot of different things to fill in time. But now it's let's really focus on what's the most important concepts and let's draft it in the most rigorous way um, and in a way um, that doesn't, um, I'm trying, let's see, require like a lot of new technology as well, because that takes up some time um, on the teacher's end is trying to uh, incorporate the technology when we need to focus on the content first. Um, I've just encouraged teachers to plan out the time. In planning, actually put in how much time do you think that will take? I think that, like Sherelle said, when we're in the classroom, we have this extra time that in the virtual setting feels very differently, especially when we're doing things involving new technology. And so part of what I always tell teachers is think about the activities that you're planning, how much time do you believe that will take, right? And understanding that even in the virtual setting, that engagement piece. Build in how much time it is, kind of like when you're asking those questions, because one of the biggest pushes we have is that we still want to have equity of student voice, right? We don't, I don't want to jump into a class and it's just the teacher, the teacher, the teacher, the teacher, right? We, we still want the kids to be able to talk through what they're learning. And so one of the biggest things is just saying, think through the time piece, right? Think through how much time do you think that it would take the students to do that? How much time do you want to give? And then also just encouraging maybe using timers. Um, we're going to take five minutes for you to, you know, kind of have this conversation. And we got two minutes, you know, and because I coach in primary, you know, get your dry erase boards and, you know, write your answer and hold it up to the screen, right? And so the use of timers is really just helpful overall because kids sometimes are like, in a kindergarten class the other day, one of the students said, uh, she asked her teacher, she said, um, when is our break, <laughs> you know, because they want to know. And so having the time will allow the kids to know also, you know, how much time is still involved. And it helps the teacher to stay focused on where they are in regards, you know, to the lesson. Um, but I also think that as a coach, you have to be flexible in this space and understand that teachers are kind of going to go over time and that it should get better every week. Um, we don't want to hound teachers right now for something that is so new um, because even in the spring when we were doing it, it didn't look and feel like this. This is a lot more like real school. You know, it's kind of like we've taken the building and we brought it into our homes. And so we don't want to make someone feel bad right now, you know, especially with, oh, you know, your time management, you really got to get better with speeding these lessons up. You want to just kind of mention it and maybe during your coaching cycle say, you know, I've noticed that it took, you know, 30 minutes, you know, for this lesson, how long did you intend for it to take? And then maybe you all can thought partner together with how you can chunk that lesson out. Remember to be the thought partner and not the finger pointer. I think it's a big part of that too. Yeah, I've only got two small things to add because Cheryl and Keisha, they said it all. I mean, the, the, we and, and Guilford County Schools, we've partnered with NC State and their Friday Institute uh, to do a little bit of additional training for us. And there was two bits of information they gave to us in a recent training. And that was the time limit, especially for elementary school students. And that's about an eight to 10 minute window. Uh, and we saw a few of our teachers the first time that they were doing synchronous live were thinking, all right. It's 45 minutes to an hour. That's about the time that we would do, like you know, Keisha was saying, in the classroom. So that's, I guess, what we should teach. And then you got kids going, can I go to the bathroom? Even though no one's holding them in the chair. Like they literally could get up, walk away from the computer and go to the bathroom. But they're so trained to that that they have to you know, ask for permission and things. So recognizing for teachers to say, after about eight to 10 minutes, you've got to think about a way to shift the learning to make it physical in some capacity. And then also the carrying capacity for, for elementary school students is about one to four bits of information during that time. 
So you're thinking, you know what, maybe during that 45 minute to an hour type of class that you had in the building, we're going to have to simplify that because they're not going to get the direct feedback that they might get by putting their hand up and you being able to come over and saying, all right, independent work time, everybody. And you walk around the room. Well, now it's going to be, we just need to focus on this one strong objective or point and, and make sure that everybody has a good understanding with it. And then as I get to you, you know, in our live or in one-on-one -on -one times or in other small group times, then we can finish up and then we can really drive that home. So as far as seeing that, as far as time, I really like hearing that word chunk. I think Keisha used that word a moment ago, just chunk it up so that way it does not overwhelm them neurologically. Fred, I really appreciate your response about um, chunking it and kind of building on everyone's talk about kind of like the engagement for students. It actually leads us really well into the next highest question from the participants, which is about adult engagement. Um, so I'm curious to hear from you all if you all have any favorite techniques or tips or tricks about how to virtually engage adults um, in a virtual meeting or when you're facilitating something virtually. I'll chime in and state teachers, teachers just love fun. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've been able to come in and say, hey guys, I want you to listen to this song or hey, let's, let's take this moment to look at this YouTube video or, you, you know, one in particular, um, you know, the science teacher I referenced a moment ago that has created her own YouTube channel. She shows me these like 1940s or 1950s of this guy that jumps in. I can't remember his name. It's like Julian something. Um, but how excited she gets about these videos of just this old black and white, like science lessons and demonstrations. Uh, and we're in the year 2020. And that's still something that's like an excitement and an energy giving. Um, also, along with that, um, as a staff, we do a really good job at, at our school and, and kudos to my administration for uh, just giving us space in virtual meetings every Friday to shout out one another. And, and there's a lot of excitement that goes into that of being able to say, I'm so excited about what this group is doing or what that group is doing and just creating that sense in that culture of just you know what, I'm paying attention to you beyond just the academic because there's so much more at stake here for children. And so one of, one of the areas that, that my teachers love and they call me out from sometimes is using what's called tactical empathy, where I won't say, you know, things like, oh, I noticed or oh, I, I think that that's happening or I won't solve problems. I'll just make a blanketed statement like, it sounds like calling parents is difficult today. And then you'll get that regurgitation of just all the things that are there emotionally and then it's, all right, if you could call these three and I'll call these three, and then we're there synchronously together working, it's, it's really cool in those moments. I think another thing is to engage adults the same way you do kids. So sometimes like we've been in meetings and we've done jam boards uh, where the adults were the ones that were doing the collaboration or we've used Pear Deck meetings. And so, you know, sometimes it's just one, it serves again as that model piece, but two, it kind of keeps everybody kind of paced along and then you kind of get a feel for where they are and what their th thoughts are. So I think that it's just keeping them involved. Uh, it's, it's, I think that adults are the same way and it's probably harder for adults because when we have meetings with them, they taught all day, right? And so they're like, I don't want to look at the screen again. I, I, I don't, I don't want to look at the screen. I just want to be finished. I need a break, you know, VUSA moment. And so it is really important that you engage them in one, something that's meaningful. I've learned that if it's meaningful to teachers, they will stay engaged. You need to make sure it is something that is relevant. What, what is going on in the space? What is like most important to deal with right now? And then just making sure that they are involved. I think that those are like kind of when I plan um, team meetings, those are kind of like some of those things that like kind of stay at the forefront. Um, and we know that student data is always there and it's about how, how are we talking about this today though, right? And so sometimes it's like, oh, we're going to look at this data maybe a different way. Um, but just really making sure that you don't plan a meeting where you, are, you have a PowerPoint and then you're just going through it, reading it to them. That just doesn't work. Like they can read it themselves. And so then you'll find, you'll be looking at the screen and people are kind of looking around like the, you know, you have to make sure that it's, it's, it's relevant and that you have them involved. Don't give information that they can read for themselves. You wanna make sure it's relevant and that the collaboration is there. 
Um, so I agree with you, Keisha. If it's just a PowerPoint, just send it to them in an email, but definitely has to be relatable, um, re relevant, and engaging. So uh, we do the shout outs as well, um, but we also get some inspiration from TikTok um, every now and then. <laughs> uh, and, and just have fun with it. Um, a lot of the things we really wish that we could do uh, on campus, um, but we cannot but it's also fun to try to do it um, at home. Um, so we've done scavenger hunts um, and race back to the computers. We've done guess who the baby is. Um, and we sometimes like bring it down to like what movie um, describes your life right now. Um, and like I said, we get a lot of responses um, just from that. Um, so yeah, it's fun. <laughs> it sounds fun, I wanna do that. Um, thank you. We have time for about one more question, I think. Um, and I actually think this will combine two questions that we see on the line um, from Shauna and from Ben. Um, and so part of opportunity culture, obviously, is kind of creating this transparency and this openness among your staff to really share, collaborate, work together, and, and, and be open with your own teaching and your own vulnerabilities and your strengths. Um, and so one question on here is, what are the key ingredients that you all have found are most essential to develop that type of staff culture for transparency and openness and willingness to grow and develop together? Um, and kind of second to that, like how are these different or similar in a remote context? Um, so maybe like, especially this year, how are you kind of developing a staff culture for openness and receptiveness to feedback? Um, as you all respond, we thought it might be helpful if you can kind of remind people when your school started, because I know Keisha in Chicago, you are much closer. You just recently started, whereas North Carolina school started a little bit earlier. So it might help to kind of gauge where you're at in the, um, the openness of your building. So I am in week four um, of virtual learning. Um, and one of the things um, to build culture is just um, sharing out and letting teachers know that we're not experts uh, at this moment. We're learning at the same time um, they're learning. Um, we have uh, a different skill set as far as like the coaching aspect, but we're also learning how to coach in this space. Uh, and just being willing to say like, I don't know um, sometimes, and I would like for your input, I would like for your advice and your take on this situation and how we can actually work together. Uh, and then I can add that to my toolbox and thank you for that. I'll go. Um, so we just started last week. So this is week two. Um, I think a lot of the culture was established and we just kind of brought it over, uh, you know, from what was already established. I think one of the, the biggest ingredients that you have to establish for transparency is a relationship. They have to trust you. Um, and so you have to establish a trusting relationship where they know that you are not there to evaluate them or degrade them, but that you are there to help them meet their fullest potential. Um, and so that, that is a really big piece. And so I used to always tell teachers, you know, when I would meet with them, it's, you know, you've set the goal. I am here to help you achieve your goal. It's not my agenda being pushed on you um, whatsoever. I am not here to just take whatever I see in your room and go run back to administration like playing tattletale either. I am truly here because I am, dedicating myself to your development. Um, and so I think that that is like a really important piece. I actually have a new teacher this year, like new to teaching, not just new to my building. Like this is like her first year. And so to establish the culture with her, I made sure that, you know, initially everything she did was via email. And so in one of the emails, I sent her my phone number and asked for hers. And I sent a text message to say, you know, everything we do doesn't have to be as formal as an email, right? You can text my phone because things are going to happen. Um, in the middle of the day, things are going to happen when you need me. And I may not always be checking my email, right? And so you can send a quick text message and I'll see it and I can kind of jump around and, and be there for what you need to do. Um, and also like she had a lot of questions and I never made her feel bad about the 1 million questions. I wanted to make sure she understood that I was her person. You know, anybody watch the Grey's Anatomy, it's like you got a person. I wanted her to know I was her person. Like when you need something, you can come to me no matter how big or how small. And so when people begin to trust you, 
they will open up to you. They become more transparent with what is going on and how they're feeling, what went well, what didn't go well, because they know that you are genuinely invested in them and their success. And so you want to make sure that you, I think one of the main ingredients is establish a trusting relationship with everybody that is on your team. Yep. I 100% agree with that. That that's that's the biggest thing. And I've been fortunate. You know, I have a second year teacher, but I was with her in her first year. So, you know, the things that Keisha is saying is absolutely true. You know, she went from being very formal to you know, within the first few months, there was a lot of emotional releases for her because she was just so passionate about making a difference for children that she didn't know how to control it. Well, now going into year two, um, I'm with year two with both of the teachers that I'm working with this year. And it, it's, it's phenomenal. And like I said earlier, you know, one of my teachers said, hey, here's a, here's a podcast that I listen to. Take a listen to it. And, you know, sometimes teacher, teachers will say that. And, it, you know, this is nothing against administrators, but they're so busy with so many other big things that if you've got a staff of 20, 30, 40, you know, teachers in your building, if every one of them just passes by and says, hey, can you read this book? It's just, it's just not possible. And so I love the fact that, you know, me, Cheryl, and Keisha are in the middle there to say, you know what? you said, listen to this podcast and I'm driving right now listening to it. And I wanted to give you a call and say, I'm really interested in these four things that this author's talking about and how this connects to, and you just listen to the passion on the other end, just grow exponentially. Um, you know, one of my teachers, I was texting back and forth with her and she screenshotted the text and put it on Twitter. And I was like, Whoa, okay. I'm just making sure what we said really quick before you put all that stuff on there. But you know, it was in regards to some great stuff. And it's like, you know what? when they want to share the great things that are happening in their room, that leads to great publicity for your building. And it changes the narrative for education in your local community and on a bigger scale as well. And that's where great things happen. You get public trust, you get teacher buy-in and everything that Cheryl and Keisha said, man, that's the stuff. That's the stuff that really keeps us going as instructors and makes it easy to do this position, even though it is incredibly challenging. Thank you all. We actually do have a little bit of time for one quick follow-up question to that. Um, Cheryl, I was wondering if you could actually say a little bit more about um, your comments, especially how do you balance that I don't know attitude you were talking about and the collaboration with also being more directive when you need to to accomplish instructional goals? I feel like that's always such a hard balance of um, minding the relationship, being collaborative, um, but also being directive when you need to. I don't know if you could share a little bit more about how you balance that. You're on mute, Cheryl. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to find um, the mute button. Can you repeat that question, um, the last part? Sure, of yeah. I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on how you balance that I don't know attitude and collaboration with being more directive when you need to be in order to accomplish instructional goals. Um, so at the moment, I have varying um, um, experiences of teachers. Um, a lot of times, uh, it is um, important to say exactly what needs to be done um, so that um, we can reach our goal. Sorry. Can you hear us? Yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. All right, and, and to um, add to that, um, like I said, it's important um, that we, oh my goodness, I'm losing my thought here. Um, Kendall, I apologize for that. That's okay. I wonder, Keisha, that also kind of applies to what you were saying earlier too, um, about having people set their own goals while also, so I'm wondering how you balance when people have their own goals, but also you need to push them towards a certain direction. So I usually leverage it. Um, mm -hmm. I usually try to figure out how does the goal that they have set kind of, how can I make it marry with the bigger goal that's there? Um, and so I don't, I try, I don't try not to put them in isolation. I try to put them together so that the teachers still feel like what they've set is important. Um, and so sometimes I use that. And then once, cause sometimes teachers set goals and they're like, 
oh, I know you can push more than that, right? And then sometimes I'm like, okay, well, if I can help you get to that goal, I can push the next one further, right? Or sometimes if a teacher sets a goal and I'm like, that's not really what we need to work at, sometimes I'll say, what do you think we need to do to achieve that goal? So when we're making that list, I'll say, what about this? Like, you know, kind of ease those things in. And so we can kind of achieve those things while we work on the other goal. Um, and so it's really about marrying it. You never want to take a teacher's goal and throw it out because it's not maybe what the bigger picture goal is. You want to make sure that they're tied together, if anything, so that what they've said is still relevant and important to the work that we're doing. Yeah, and I'll, I'll speak to that too. Exactly what Keisha said, the development of checklists, because what Keisha said, their goal might be one of the things to a bigger thing. And so like she's saying, put that as one of the checks that now is evolving into a much bigger thing than they may have initially saw because they just like, like Keisha was saying, she's got her first year teacher. What she brings as a goal may be very low level, but that's a, that's a step. That, that's part of that ladder that gets her to a new place. And I like, I like that idea of scaffolding it to get somewhere. That's cool. Thank you all so much. This has just been so delightful to hear you speak. I wish we had a whole nother hour to hear you talk more and more about this, especially when on the difficult things like balancing um, stuff like that. I'm going to share my screen again to show um, kind of a summary of some of the things that we heard our MCLs talk about today. Um, so we heard MCLs think through how to check in personally with their teachers daily, even as humans and not just professionals how to give positive praise, um, even more than constructive praise. Of course, it's always important, but how do you really think about that now, about specific positive praise to show them what they're doing well and to keep doing more of? We talked about coaching cycles, how it could have been at the beginning of this pandemic to think about, oh, actually, like, let's not do coaching cycles. Let's not continue with that. But actually, we're learning more and more to continue with that, but just to adapt to how you do it in the format. Keisha talked about modeling and co-teaching. Um, how could you have people come observe you or you go observe them or um, you could do something together? Um, there are a lot of options there to continue, continue some hands-on support. I talked a lot about leading team meetings. How do you lead those virtually? How do you incorporate some of these personal check-ins um, and these pieces to make sure that people are feeling good and they're able to move forward amid crises? And then lastly, which we briefly touched on, but not as deeply, and I'd love to talk even more about this, is how can you continue to provide student support? Um, so one of the things teachers across the nation talk about loving most about their MCLs is when they're able to analyze the data and then really target students, pull them one-on-one, -on -one, pull small groups virtually, and really lean in to help with remediation, with acceleration, and things like that. Um, if we had more time, I'd love to ask about that with our MCLs. So many of you all are familiar with our website, and if you are, you know we frequently publish free tools and resources on our website. I'd actually like to highlight a couple of those now if I screen share. Um, so if you go to opportunityculture.org, which you should be able to see on your screen, um, you can actually see our first banner here is responding to COVID-19, where we have several resources if you click learn more about um, at-home teaching and learning. Um, so I encourage you to check that out and see how that, um, all these different things, including addressing students' trauma and lots of other resources. Um, we also have several critical um, resources on critical elements of instructional leadership and excellence. And so you can access those if you click over here for resources for educators and they go down one tab to instructional leadership and excellence. Um, you can see here our framework that Sharon sent out earlier. Um, we have leading a team and we have achieving instructional excellence. And you can click on many of these things for resources and for videos and for things like that. A couple other things I wanted to point out, there's also several other resources under this resources for educators tab, including newsletters, you'll actually see information from this webinar that will be posted right here on this tab and for hopefully future webinars. And then lastly, I would encourage you to check out the what are people saying tab. Here you can see voices from our OC fellows, just like our MCLs here on the line today. Um, you can see educator columns, um, you can see voices on video, um, and several other things about opportunity culture in the media. Um, so check it out. There's a lot of free stuff there, and I'd encourage everyone to, to see what's going to be helpful. 
Lastly, I'm really excited to share this brand new opportunity with you all. Um, so we are, because of this virtual world we're living in, we actually have the opportunity to provide even more collaboration across districts and across the world, or not the world, the nation, maybe the world one day. Um, and so for the first time, we're able to offer a national professional learning series that's open for any opportunity culture principal or administrator, MCL, team reach teacher, or reach associate. So if you are an opportunity culture educator or district leader and your district's not currently providing opportunity culture related professional development, um, consider joining our cohort. You can see on the screen um, we have for each of the four strands here, we have role specific PD and there's a, a combination of content delivery and collaboration structured protocols called a problem of practice. Given the frequency of these meetings that are about monthly, the sessions are gonna be about an hour and a half to two hours. Um, and so we're trying to minimize any time away from the classroom. Due to the virtual nature of the standardized professional learning cohort, districts or even individuals can actually receive this professional development at a much lower cost than could have been in previous years. Um, so we're really excited about this opportunity and for the collaboration it could allow across the nation. You'll see more details in the follow-up email and contact information if you'd like to reach out to find more information. Of course, you can always follow us on social media um, to be the first to know about new materials or new opportunities. Um, we will send everyone on this call um, the Opportunity Culture newsletter if you haven't received it already. Of course, you can always unsubscribe if you prefer, um, but it has a lot of really useful resources, tools, and information that we found really helpful. And as I log off, if you are joining us and you are an MCL, an OC administrator, um, or another educator in an opportunity culture school, we have private Facebook groups for you to connect with others that are in your role. Um, so do consider us, these links are on the screen. Sharon can also email them out or chat them out. Um, but on it, we see um, a pretty rich discussion where people are discussing advice, materials, collaborating across districts and across the nation, um, and really just be able to discuss in a closed private setting with others who are in your same role. I thank you all for joining us today. It was a pleasure getting to talk to these three MCLs. Um, getting, I hope you all found it useful, um, and I hope that you're able to have a takeaway that will help you better support teachers um, in your circle. You can find my contact information on the screen. We'll also, again, send that follow-up email that will have more information and a link to any of the resources that we have here today. Um, so thank you all for joining us, and we hope to see you all again soon at another function. Bye, everyone. <laughs>